Today we'll be taking a look at the third fully evolved starter with a Meganium solo run in Pokemon Crystal. Both Typhlosion and Feraligator, they got really high marks. They're some of the best runs I've ever done to date, so I've been interested to finalize the trilogy. Up front, Meganium has some obvious problems, but let's kind of go through it piece by piece and we'll start with the stats. Like all starters, everything's pretty good here. Actually exceptional, I would say, and the distribution kind of focuses on the defensive side of things and that combined with that medium slow leveling group just sets up a really nice base for the run. As for the learn set, starting with Razor Leaf is pretty nice and we'll come back to that in a minute, but tackle for that neutral normal coverage isn't the worst thing in the world. You even get Body Slam, which is kind of a rarity in Gen 2, and things are a little sparse when you look in the TM department. Outside of the standard things like Headbutt and eventually Return, Earthquake is just about the best move that you can learn. Outside of that, really good things like Giga Drain, they're locked behind the Kanto section of the game, but before we go any further, likes and comments, they really do help out a ton. So if you have a spare second or if you are a returning subscriber like Adam Sylvester, I do appreciate the support and you guys know what time it is. Sit back, grab yourself that sodi pop strap in and let's see how this one plays out. Let's hop right into that initial rival battle. There's not much going on here, and all you need to know is that even though Razor Leaf is resisted, it's going to be the better choice here in a lot, and we can talk about Gen 2's crit changes real quick. In Gen 1, moves that have a high crit rate like Razor Leaf, they'll give you an 8 times crit modifier, and since crits were based on your speed in Gen 1, anything above a 12.5% base chance to crit would crit 100% of the time with these moves. In Gen 2, things are a little bit different. Pokemon all have the same base chance to crit and without going into crit stages too much and just being kind of boring just know that moves like razor leaf have a flat 25 percent chance to crit in this game and one out of four it's not bad there are lots of parts that i'm not going to show in the video where razor leaf is just the outright best move choice even when it's resisted outside of some rare exceptions razor leaf's damage numbers is going to be ahead of most things unless you start looking at stuff like zubat or bellsprout that double resist it now let's talk about meganium and why this run was so interesting to me. It really just comes down to the typing and a pure grass type Pokemon has to be among the worst to play in this game. With the leveling curve of Johto, you can just really brute force your way past many things later in the game. But when you consider this about Meganium, just think about this for a second. The first gym leader uses flying Pokemon. The second one uses bug types. Every Pokemon on the rivals team is going to resist grass moves. And ultimately the fourth gym is going to resist grass, be immune to normal. And when you take all of those things into account, it's just a, it's an uphill battle. To put things into perspective, I started routing this run early in June. I wanted to get it out pretty much right after the Feraligator video, and I just could not get that blend of speed and consistency to feel right. So I just kept putting it off week after week. So let's kind of start going through the route that I eventually settled on. As for the early game, I do battle all the trainers before Violet City for some extra experience, and we'll be taking on the Sprout Tower today. Now, you guys know that good runs don't even have to do this, but with the first gym being flying, it just makes the most sense. And as we're going to see soon, all these levels really, they're not that necessary for Faulkner, but the extra training will help later on. Now, by the time I finish this up and I end up finishing the underling gym trainers, I am level 15 and I think we're ready to take on Faulkner. When I brought up Razor Leaf earlier, this is the precise type of situation I talked about where it performs better even when it's resisted. The damage itself is not even that bad if it doesn't crit since we're comparing it to Tackle, it's so weak, but that 25% chance to crit makes really short work, and I do crit twice here. I one shot the Pidgey, I take the Pidgeotto down to the red, and this one's a done deal. Now combine all that with the extra levels and the fact that Meganium is bulky, you just have a really easy battle here, and just like that, this one's over. And you might be saying, hey Matt, that didn't look bad at all, it looked easy. Why did you get up to such a high level? And I agree, I said as much. You don't have to be this high, but let's not forget Faulkner, he just has a level seven Pidgey. I think even if you had something that was double weak to flying, it wouldn't really have much trouble here depending on the moves. And out of everything in this run that's gonna be working against Meganium, this is gonna be the easiest hurdle. So let's kind of just start working towards those harder situations. Now, first up, I do pick up the Hearthstone from our old pal, Arthur, and we're gonna be using this much later. And today we're gonna be doing a first for the runs. We're gonna be 
be picking up Miracle Seed at the start of Route 32. It's going to boost Razor Leaf's damage. And here's where Meganium is going to start to inject some extra time in the run where other good Pokemon, the other starters didn't have to worry about. To prepare for Bugsy, I need some levels. And there's a few extra trainers here. There's a few fishermen. You don't want to battle this bottom one. He has like 10 Magikarps. It's a waste of your time, my time, everybody's time. There's also a Wooper trainer here. And that's pretty much it for Route 32. Those are just the easiest one-shot little groups of experience you can get. And when we move on to Union Cave, I do battle every trainer on the first floor since most of them are weak to Razor Leaf. There's a few fire top trainers, a couple of poison top trainers, but like I said earlier, it's really not that big of a deal. I take them out nonetheless. Now for the thing that took a lot of extra time for Meganium. To make Bugsy consistent, I just need a little more experience, so I did opt to battle wild Pokemon here. I choose to do it now because just about every wild spawn is going to be an easy one shot and most of them are going to be weak to grass. In an ideal situation, you would just get these encounters as you're walking through the cave naturally. You wouldn't have to stop or do anything like that, but I don't get it here. I have to kind of walk back and forth at the exit. And I guess now is as good of a time as any to mention that I didn't pick up the repel. You'll pick it up for pretty much every run, but if you did pick it up, these encounters wouldn't be possible. So overall, the goal here is to be level 19, about halfway to 20, and let's kind of keep the pace moving. We can skip over the slowpoke well, and we can move on to the little quirks of the run. Today, we're going to be taking on rival number two first, and I mentioned earlier that his entire team is pretty decent against grass types. Ghastly is first, and this is another example of Razor Leaf being the way to go. A crit can easily one-shot, and it's going to be a two-shot regardless, so would Mud Slap, but I end up missing with that 95% accuracy, but thankfully it just goes for Lick. I don't get paralyzed or anything like that, and we just get to move on for free, basically. Zubat is next. It does double resist grass moves, but let's not forget, at its heart, at the core of everything, it's still a Zubat. It does its absolute best to be annoying, but two tackles will take it out. I am confused, but we only have the Quill Lava left, and at this point, I'm pretty much at full health. I'm set up to where I can easily just drop its accuracy with a few mud shots, and I'm just in a strong position to take this out. Afterwards, we're forced to do something that it's not the best, and it didn't feel great, but in the name of consistency, it just had to be done, guys. I have to take an early Alex Forest visit, I have to wrangle in the Farfetch'd, and we have to get access to Cut. This move is not great. If you have to learn this move, you know the run's pretty much not going to be elite, but it is a strict upgrade to Tackle, and believe it or not, this is kind of like the missing piece of the puzzle for Meganium's run. I do battle all the underling trainers in the gym, except for the Paris trainer, and I think now we can just start to talk about Bugsy, let's go into some depth. First off, let's address the extra levels. I was trying this earlier, and even at level 20, this one felt very inconsistent. I was trying this with Tackle, I was setting up Reflect on the final Kakuna, I was trying to outpace the Scyther, and I think without luck, and even with the increased damage of Cut, you would likely have to like replay this segment 15 times, and just kind of keep doing the run until you got it right, and end up making like a disingenuous video to where it seems like you didn't have to reset a lot, but I digress. But I do say this time and time again, guys, consistency is kind of my my main goal for Gen 2 runs, and level 23 is that magic number without a doubt. I have no doubt in my mind about it. What this one comes down to is that even if you set up a reflect, four Fury Cutters is going to take you down, and level 23 just guarantees that three shot on Scyther. Without the three shot, this one is extremely difficult, and I think it's highly likely that this will be the toughest battle in the game, and it's kind of what I mold over the most, but we do get it done here, and I love seeing the preparation come together like this. Uh, the battle's over, we get the badge, but let's talk about it more. So this is pretty Pretty much the one battle I kind of thought about for like six weeks before making the video. Let's elaborate a little more. First, let's take a look at the, I got damage numbers for you guys today. Now the first one here is going to be the level 20 damage and the second one's going to be the level 23 version we just saw. And you can see that the level 20 generally requires four turns to knock out the Scyther. Now if you took any chip damage earlier, maybe a poison sting, or even if you took something like a string shot, the fight becomes a lot less likely and it can happen a lot. The three turn guarantee is just so much much better and that's not even kind of counting in the extra bulk that three extra levels provide you. I did think about this one a lot and I thought about this weird kind of growl and reflect strategy. Maybe you would set up reflect on Kakuna on the final turn and then you would open up with a growl on the Scyther. But the damage here is just not great. Let's take a look at this. This is the damage ranges for a Scyther that has already growled two times. And you can see here that a four turn Fury Cutter is still a 100% guarantee to knock you out, which is going to make it to because at level 20 it's going to require 
require four cuts and you're using a turn on grouse. So it's going to make it to it regardless. Now I'm just showing these numbers to let you guys get a full picture as to why a level 20 clear time I think is inconsistent at best. And at worst, it felt like a guaranteed three to five resets until you get lucky or maybe the Scyther misses a Fury Cutter or you get a critical hit. And I don't want to go into too much detail about it, but I think the level 20 strategy is pretty bad. It's, it's kind of garbage. It's too luck based for my blood. Now maybe I'm wrong about this, but I did test this a lot of times, more than I would probably normally test things for my run. And I always try to avoid watching other videos about the same Pokemon and other challenges because I want it to be my video. I don't want to be influenced by somebody else's video. I think everybody should have that approach. But I've said this many times, guys. I'm always willing to admit that I'm not perfect. I could be wrong. And if you guys think that there's something obvious that I'm missing, you can go ahead and tell me down below. I think it's awesome that some of you do runs or you know how to kind of analyze these kind of things. So I'm interested to know. Now with that out of the way, Headbutt is up next. It's a big upgrade, but let's take a second and talk about the weird thing about this run, and that's the addition of Cut. It essentially takes up a dead space on our inventory because it's an HM, and we really can't do anything about it until we make it to Blackthorn. And that just means we don't have much flexibility here. We have three moves to work with, and it's not really like Meganium has a ton of moves to use anyway, so it's fine. At this point, Headbutt, you need it. Razor Leaf, need it. Mud Slap, it really helps for the Magnemites littered around the game. And you can work around it. It's not too bad, but it is something unique that I really haven't had to deal with so far in any of my runs, and it made Meganium feel kind of different. As for Goldenrod, we do the usual errands, and that means that we get to see our boy Juggler Erwin out here with his level 2 Voltorb, and that's always a treat to me. Papa Sodi Pop for Juggler Erwin. Now, ultimately, I do pick up Return at the Mart for future use, and we can kind of just jump straight into Whitney. Razor Leaf, it just puts in work here. We've talked about it time and time again. Now, these are unresisted Razor Leaves, so the crits really aren't even needed and this one's very comfortable and like always the normal top damage boost from this badge it comes in handy in pretty much 99.9% .9 of the runs and now we're going to talk about some of the differences between the optimized run compared to my initial trial runs and just to keep it brief and kind of summarize things real quick it was extra training when I got to the end of my third run you guys know I usually do three runs for this kind of stuff it just didn't feel good I wasn't happy with my time and I was like you know things just felt off they didn't feel good and it turns out I was just over leveling for some reason I guess it had been about a month since I had played gen 2 and I had this bad mindset where I was saving I was kind of hoarding all my resources in preparation for red and you guys know that red is an optional fight for me and we time it at the blue split so when I kept that in mind and I got things back on track I started to litter in rare candies at various points in the run and I was able to cut out anywhere from probably about 20 I would say yeah, 20 battles sounds pretty good that alone saved me a lot of time so from this point on we're not really going to see a ton of extra battles because Bugsy was the thing that really took up the most time and I wanted to mitigate those time losses so we'll kind of see how it plays out here. I do make my way up to Ecritique. We take on the Kimono Girls. There's not really much to say about it and we've talked about the rival having heavily resisted grass Pokemon and we've talked about Morty. He's kind of a nightmare too so it makes a lot of sense to go ahead and head west. Pick up that Mint Berry. Go ahead and do the full training in the Lighthouse. Get all those extra levels and then after we catch our Krabby and do all the errands down there, we can return and we can go ahead and pick up this rival fight. And I want you guys to take a good look at this one. Hunter is up first and I let a razor leave loose. Now we've been over the damage despite being resisted, but here it just misses that KO. It applies curse and we should be fine. Now here's where the series of unfortunate events start. I accidentally go for a double resisted razor leaf. It doesn't do anything. This lets the bat apply supersonic and I do get off the move. We do move on. The Quilava comes in and this is tragic. It has super effective damage. I have curse on me and when you combine that with some bad luck of me hurting myself too two times in a row due to confusion, you do see the first reset of the run here as a result. Overall, this is rather unlucky, and those sets of events are they're really unlikely to occur again. And you can see here how simple the fight can be. We just kinda, we could skip ahead to the Quilava and Body Slam's damage. It's enough to easily outpace. The Magnemite goes down to a single mud shot, and this one is over. Let's move on to the next gym. 
Once again, grass is resisted, but the crit can make up for it. I don't crit here. I miss that one shot and we get cursed, which is the position you really don't want to be in with Morty. Hunter is next. It's a little more tough, so Mud Slap feels better since it's, it's a guaranteed two shot. I move first. The accuracy drop doesn't matter. I take a Nightshade along with the curse damage and we're already at about half health. I do have the Mint Berry here to nullify one Hypnosis here and the Gengar misses the first one, but the problem here is that I'm on a really tight clock with curse and it's a three shot to knock it out with mud slap. Things go good here as far as the moves go. It doesn't do much thanks to the miss and the mint berry, but curse is the issue here. This means by the time it's all said and done, I'm down to a measly 7 HP, and the issue here is that there's not much hope, so I kind of just throw a Hail Mary Razor Leaf into the Haunter, and it just misses the knockout. That means we have our second reset in the last two battles. On the next attempt, I'm going to admit a mistake. I'm not above this. I don't actually have all the damage ranges memorized, and Mud Slap is actually a guaranteed one shot and it can just take the ghastly out guaranteed so that means there's no curse and overall that means that this is a much cleaner battle i also think i said mud shot earlier because i get that and mud slap confused a lot so excuse that i don't know if i did or not i'm pretty sure i did now overall the haunter actually uses up my mint berry here but the gengar misses two hypnosis and at the end of the battle i actually finish at full health and just like with the rival fight some bad luck or just not meticulously knowing the damage numbers can result in some frustrating resets. And at the end of the day, you might be thinking, why not just redo the run? You could easily beat the third rival and Morty in one shot. You could cut out the resets. And the reasoning here is that if I give Meganium a fourth run, it not only takes up time, but then I'll have to start thinking about giving other Pokemon a fourth run. And eventually that's going to lead to something getting a fifth run. And even though I optimize these runs, it's important to remember that there's still human error and perfection is not the ultimate goal for me. If that was the case, I think I would just do tool assisted speed runs with zero room for error. And when it's all said and done, I'm happy with runs if they have like a variance of uh, maybe plus or minus a few minutes and it's not that big of a deal. Let's move on. Next up, we can head over to the Lake of Rage. Elite runs can just maybe pick up the hidden power if they even want to, but I've really grown to love tackling the rocket hideout section earlier. It makes a tedious section of the game actually give relevant levels for Pokemon that struggle a little, and that's kind of what we're doing today because Meganium isn't the best run in the world. Now it's time for that swift swim down to Cinnabar, and before you know it, it's already time for Chuck, brother! And today this one is not too bad. Chuck wasn't an issue either way, no matter which way you routed it. And all I can say that if Morty didn't use up the Mint Berry, I would equip it here just in case Polyrath survives a hit. Maybe it goes for Hypnosis, it would waste a lot of time. It does actually survive this attempt, but it just goes for Dynamic Punch. It confuses me, but it doesn't matter. This one is a one and done deal. With access to Fly, it's time for a backtrack. Today I'll be picking up the Pink Bow from Tuscany west of New Bark. Outside of the PP ups and the Rare Candies, the Soft Sand just south of the Goldenrod Rare Candy. It's a pretty big adjustment to the run. Now we'll go into the significance of it later. We'll talk about it. We'll keep it simple for now, but let's just say it was crucial for some key battles down the line. Now let's clean up those final gym leaders. Price, he just lives up to his reputation. We take him out clean. No need to go over it. And Jasmine isn't too bad. Now I do forget here in the footage, I use a mud slap, but at this level, Razor Leaf's neutral damage to Steelix is a guaranteed two shot. It does use a full restore, waste a little bit of time, but it's not bad at all. And normally this is where we're going to talk about that dreaded phone call about the rocket takeover of the radio tower, but today's run's a little bit different. While not as limiting and time consuming as Bugsy, this part was quite the puzzle. Now I mentioned tons of extra battles, and this is where I made the call to use some early candies here. Now when you get to the top of the radio tower during this little initial visit, this executive with five coughings and a wheezing is an absolute nightmare if you're not prepared. On the blind run, it was god awful. Now whether it be poison, accuracy lowering moves, or anything between this fight was not fun. The solution here was very simple. Level 45, use a couple of rare candies. You get return with the extra damage over body slam. Combine that with a pink bow, and it makes all these coughings a guaranteed one shot. Now this really alleviates the pressure of this fight by a lot, and it makes it really straightforward and simple. Now you might notice in the footage that I'm not one shotting some of the coughings, and that's because my brain turned off. I forgot to actually use the pink bow that I went out of my way to get, but I still make it work. But it's really important to know that this fight was a huge roadblock. Now keep in mind that you guys always watch the optimized run, but this fight, Bugsy, and a couple of later fights is what delayed this run as long as it was. It really gave me a lot of headaches.
Before we hop into the final badge, here is where we can finally remove cut. There's a move deleter next to the center in Blackthorn. It's not really too interesting, but there's a chance that we could probably go years without seeing the move deleter again. So I thought I would document it here. Move deleter. Maybe the first and only time. Now let's jump into Claire. With the extra levels and the candy usage from earlier, this one is really simple. We are already a pretty bulky Pokemon, but now return hits hard enough to one-shot the Dragonairs. And since I remembered the pink bow finally, it's straightforward. I know people bring up Hidden Power Ice a lot. They talk about Claire, but return makes Claire just as simple in my opinion. So there's not much to talk about here. Afterwards, there's not anything extra, but I do go a little bit out of the way. I pick up the two extra rare candies. You can see here that they really don't take up that much time. Time. There's one in the Seafoam Islands. There's one in Mount Mortar. They're very quick to get to if you know the way. And outside of getting access to Earthquake and Victory Road, I think we can just kind of jump straight into the Elite Four. First up is Wheel, and finally this late in the video we can talk about Hidden Power. We are using the Rock Top Hidden Power, and I have the Hardstone equipped. Now this lets you hit more one-shot ranges, but it's really not required for this fight specifically. It's just kind of one of those things that we're going to be using soon anyway, and it seemed like the best spot to talk about it since Wheel's not that interesting. It's not too bad. Wheel's usually not that bad, but that's one of the Elite Four down. After the battle, I do heal up using Super Potions for some reason, and here's the first instance of Soft Sand being useful and let's hop into Koga and see why. We have great coverage for Koga. Hidden Power Rock and Earthquake do work here. It's a pretty clean sweep outside of the Crobat. You know how it likes to use double team. Maybe it could set up Toxic, but here it's pretty clean. We get past it. Two shots, don't miss, don't have any statuses. And now let's enter the Fortress. Without Soft Sand, it's a four shot. Now this thing is extremely bulky. And if you falter earlier in the fight, maybe something gets toxic on you. Maybe you get your accuracy debuffed or something like that. Or if you just have general bad luck like I usually do, you can lose this fight, and I did lose this fight. With Soft Sand, you have a guaranteed three shot, and it made things just feel a little bit smoother, and you can see how high of health we have at the end of this fight. As for Bruno, 126 effective power return with the pink bow. It's about all you need to know. It's all we need. There's only one scary part of this fight, and that's Cross Chop and its increased crit chance. Even though it has lower accuracy, it lands here. It does a ton of damage, but thankfully, Bruno is just Bruno today. And we're moving on to that fourth challenge. Karen is next, and thankfully Return is a comfortable two-shot range on the Umbreon. I do take a Sand Attack here, unfortunately. Now, it's annoying, but there's really nothing you can do about it. Let's see how this one plays out with the Sand Attack on us. Now, Vileplume is neutral to Earthquake, so that means Return is still going to be the play. Now, I, I get paralyzed here, and at this point, with a Sand Attack and the Status Condition, it's kind of the worst-case scenario for this fight, but I'm still pretty healthy, and we're just going to play it out and see how it goes. This means that the Houndoom is next and we can see just how bulky Meganium is. We tank a flamethrower pretty well here. I'm still in the yellow health. When it comes to my turn, I don't miss. The earthquake lands and it takes us on. Once again, we are conceding the first turn due to paralysis and Gengar uses curse. And I think this is one of the only times that curse is actually a good thing because I'd rather have this dot damage on us rather than the upfront damage since we are low and we have all the stuff on us. So at the end of the day, this means that it's up to if we hit the move on Murkrow. It goes first, it hits a fan attack it takes us down to the red health and Meganium clutches up it doesn't let the paralysis hold it back and we take the battle despite the really rough start and now let's just jump straight into another rough fight For this one, I had to use two more rare candies to get up to level 58. I have the Hardstone, and it goes without saying that his team full of flying types do pose a challenge. Now, Gyarados is not an issue. We can move on and we can talk about the problems with this fight. And I think pretty much 99% of the problems with this fight comes down to this first Dragonite, and Thunder Wave is going to be the worst case scenario, and it's always, pretty much always going to go for it. It does have a 25% chance to miss just due to how the AI is coded, but it hits here, and you might not see it just yet because we tank this blizzard just fine but this pretty much makes this fight nearly impossible to actually win and we'll see why obviously skipping your turn is awful but the cut speed combined with that means that you get results like this where the aerodactyl gets off multiple wing attacks and we are in a dire state the hidden power can one shot it but at this point we're too low the fight is pretty much over and with our speed cut in half charizard is next and i think you already know what's going to be for dinner tonight and also if you are a keen-eyed viewer you might know 
notice that my resets are one off, but it's going to be corrected at the end of the video. Don't pay too much attention to that. On the next attempt, we're going to see a theme like the earlier battles we reset on. The difference is going to be night and day. All it takes is Dragonite missing Thunder Wave, and that's pretty much the fight over since I maintain my speed. This means that not only is the Aerodactyl a very clean and easy one shot, but the double weak to Rock Charizard gets what he deserves as well. In the back, he has two more Dragonites. The first one here has Fire Blast, but we are really tanky. It doesn't get stab on it, so we just kind of shrug it off. We move on to the end. And here I kind of I ran out of hidden power PP, and I have a mini panic attack because I forgot to use an elixir. And you would think that return is fine, but the thing is that this Dragonite also knows Thunder Wave. And even though I thought this one was a done deal, I start to take some damage, maybe miss my turn. I'm kind of sweating, I'm getting down to the red health, but at the end of the day, Meganium pulls it out, and the Elite Four is finished. Now, rather than give you some spiel about moving on to Kanto, uh, I do want to talk about Lance a little more. It's important to know that this fight is essentially the same fight if you do it at level 58 or level 65. One-shotting the Dragonites takes a significant investment, and it's worth risking resets rather than overtraining. Now, if you can remember back, if you're a loyal viewer, you remember the very first Machop stream I did a while ago. Now, sometimes I fall into this trap of overtraining, and I fall for this false idea that a more consistent run equals a faster run, and this is an example of a run that initially did the same thing. It was much slower than what we'll see at the end of this one, and I sacrificed some consistency to shave off like 10 minutes. It's this very weird feeling, like this weird balance. Sometimes it's hard to see the bigger picture, but I did want to bring it up. Now we can finally fade to black. Let's blast through Kanto. Like always, there's not much to say about the first seven gems of Kanto, but I do often get comments that'll say things like, Meganium's gonna struggle with Blaine, or whatever type is relevant to the run that I'm doing. And I just wanna know, when will you guys learn how bad the leveling curve is for this part of the game? Now this is the Blaine fight, let's take a look at it. Outside of some mistakes, maybe where you're out of Earthquake PP, or you enter the fight missing 75% of your health, this is how every fight looks up into the blue fight. I don't mind the comments, it's great for the engagement, but it's just confusing how many times people say that you're going to struggle on some of these Kanto fights considering how easy they always are. Outside of that, I do some slightly different routing here. I take on Erica last because the extra levels let you put some things into a one-shot range, but I do get put to sleep here so it completely nullifies my idea and strategy here. But overall, this is about the same amount of time you would spend in Kanto as any other run. And before we move on to the blue fight, it's time to talk about Soft Sand. Sure, it did put Fortress into a three-shot range and it's pretty insignificant. The real reason is found in this fight. Now I also use the last three rare candies I have to get up to level 68 and let's kind of dive into this one. Pidgeotis first, I have super effective damage, and it's generally not a one shot here, but I do crit, and that lets us avoid some damage, we can move on. Executor is really bulky, and return is not guaranteed here, it's not a guaranteed two shot, but our luck continues, we do get the range, and now we can kind of move on to the actual problem of this fight, and it's Arcanine. This is where Soft Sand combined with level 68 was pretty much the only solution that I had for this fight without overtraining. If you take early damage, this fight becomes infinitely harder, and remember, Remember that we mostly see the optimized runs on my channel, and it's going to look really simple here. I'm just going to one-shot it very easy, but this one did take a lot of testing to kind of tweak the numbers in my favor. Now from there, once you take out the Arcanine, this one's a done deal. There's a Rhydon in the back. He's double weak to Giga Drain. Alakazam is defensively frail. We can easily one-shot it. And even though the Gyarados does try to survive with 17 full restores, the final result, it's etched in stone, and that ends the split here for Meganium. Meganium finishes its blue split with a time of 1 hour, 19 minutes, and 12 seconds with 3 resets, but let's not rank it just yet because we need to focus on red. For those new, I think the red fight is really overtuned, and if you put it into the time section of the run, it's going to make the whole run just work towards that. This means that there's going to be a ton of overleveling in a run where you already overlevel everything, and it generally means that you have no strategic options like using candies early because you need all of them to fight his level 100 Pokemon, but I digress. Essentially, the run up to the end of blue is the time that I record, and then we take a look at what a consistent red fight looks like, and we can just kind of look at it and see the results of that now.
The magic number for today is level 75 using leftovers. The learn set is exactly the same, and as for Pikachu, it's irrelevant. Return or Earthquake can one-shot it, and we don't have to waste any more time talking about this rat anymore. Venusaur is next, and it's an odd choice for the AI to send out. I guess maybe it's because of the poison type, but it only has resisted moves to throw at us. I can tank them really easy, and leftovers makes the damage really minimal. This is going to take us three returns to get through, and just like Pikachu, this one is not bad at all. Outspeeding Charizard is really all you need to know about this part. It's double weak to rock. We've already seen it back in the Lance fight. It gets absolutely obliterated with hidden power, and we can kind of start to move on to the back end of the fight. Espeon comes out, and Reflect is pretty much going to be the worst case scenario. It's a, Normally, it's a two-shot with return, but here it just goes for Psychic. And for me, the worst part about this fight in practice was Snorlax. If you haven't looked at this thing's stats, do it now. This thing has so much health, and with Amnesia, any special attacking Pokemon is pretty much shut down on the spot. Even with return, it takes a while to chew through its nearly 350 HP stat, and when you combine that with rest, it's no wonder that this Pokemon is a problem for pretty much all runs. I firmly believe that Snorlax on Red's team is the most problematic thing about the fight. And if he didn't have this Pokemon on his team, I think you could make it through this fight much earlier and the pacing of the overall game would feel better. But for the purposes of this run, I can outpace it with Return and with the bulk of this long neck Dino, I make it pass pretty easy. And at the end is Blastoise. We have Giga Drain and I think we know where this one's going to end up. And this finalizes Meganium's run. Now let's pull up the card. We have the resets fixed here. Overall, this run wasn't anywhere close to the other starters and I don't think anyone is surprised by that. Grass is just so weak. Now maybe there's a world where you can skim by Bugsy a few levels earlier, maybe save a minute or two, but it's still, even with that hypothetical scenario, it still wouldn't even scratch the top few runs on the tier list. I'm confident with that level 23 Bugsy strat, but I do like to keep an open mind. So this one's going to fall right before Steelix. I think Steelix was a pretty bad run, but since we don't have many crystal runs to look at the data, it's really hard to say at this point. I think at the end of the day, Meganium will be like a solid B tier Pokemon, but for now, it does look a little low at the bottom of the tier list. Now, one day I'm going to redo things like Tyranitar, Ho-Oh, Igglybuff, but I think this is fine for now. And special shout out to my channel members and Patreons. I really do appreciate the support, and today I'm going to try something different. If you're still listening to my voice now, you're a real one, and you should comment that down below just so I know, because I love knowing that. And if you want access to the patch files that I use for the cross-gen runs, you can sign up to be a member or a Patreon if that sounds interesting to you and I guess if you just want to support me you can do that as well but I'm just going to cut the video here and I'm going to test out not doing an outro to see if that helps anything you always got to kind of test things out but I'll see you on the next video bye